Again, my name is uh, Brian Snelling. I'm a, a member of the IH team. I'm a neurosurgeon by training. Um, and I'm happy to have with us today, Dr. Raj Kamal Kangura. He's a neurointerventional radiologist and he's the medical director of neurointerventional radiology at Sutter Medical Center in Sacramento, California. Um, it's been a it's been a little few weeks, uh, my friend, getting you getting everything, uh, our, all of our schedules aligned. So we're really happy to have you here. We're really excited to hear your talk about your experience in diagnosing and treating IH patients. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll chime in with some questions or thoughts, uh, but I don't really want to interrupt you and uh, want to let you share your experience. So really happy to have you and uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Brian. No, super excited for this opportunity. I uh, had a chance to see, you know, all the webinars and I really wanted to share something that was different that uh, is beyond maybe the, um, you know, the the kind of the basics of IH and just kind of share, you know, what we're saying, you know, the, at what I'm saying at the clinical level. Um, so, you know, my experience with treating IH has been kind of working within a multidisciplinary nurse, you know, neuroscience group with, uh, with neurosurgeons, neurologists, neuropathologists who kind of look at the disease as a whole and say, okay, what's the best way that we can help these patients? And so, um, you know, it's nice to, to kind of share that um, kind of experience. So thank you everybody uh, for the opportunity and, and chiming in. Um, it's really a privilege to kind of share this clinical experience. Uh, I don't have any disclosure regarding um, IH or venous anastenting. So, you know, when I really think about IIH and kind of our um, treatment, we've really looked at the, you know, the medical and the the uh, non-surgical options versus the surgical management. So by the time I have typically, uh, you know, seen the patient, there is already a diagnosis, including imaging and kind of workup with the, the modified Dandy criteria. And so I get kind of involved in terms of, you know, helping uh, help the patient make a decision in terms of what treatment option or, um, you know, approach that they think would be best for, for their condition. And so, um, you know, much like other medical conditions, you know, we, we really try to exhaust the conservative and then the medical, the non-procedural um, treatments first. So um, by the time we're kind of having a the discussion, they've, that that's kind of already been answered. And so that's, we have neurologists and our neurosurgeons and our neuroophthalmologists who are, who are kind of um, on the front line for this. So, you know, where I feel that, um, you know, neurointerventionalists come in really into this play of this disease is the, you know, the central kind of um, pivot point for this disease, which is the venous sinus stenosis. And so regardless of all the kind of the discussions about you know, is it the medical disease? Is it the, the disease of endocrinology? Is it the disease of uh, of vascular origin? The really not thinking about necessarily the the uh, initial um, you know kind of impetus, but really you know what is really the 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 pathophysiology that's kind of that needs to be addressed, and that ends up being the venous stenosis, regardless if it's causing your increase. Um, you know, CSF or pressures or um, sym symptomology related to just increased venous, chronic venous hypertension. And so what I've clinically seen is that when I see these patients, it tends to be more of uh, a two type of, you know, phenotypes that present in, in practice and when I'm reviewing the imaging. Either there's a focal transverse sinus stenosis, um, short segment that the remainder of the sinus looks fairly healthy, it looks um, essentially uninvolved, or there's the phenotype of the patients with the long segment stenosis. And those, from, from my experience, have tend to be the more fulminant type of patients with the papilledema presentation. But the focal ones may have, I would say, the... the um, the varying presentation and Dr. Goban kind of has nicely showed in the past that there's a myriad of these uh, constellation of symptoms that the patients have in IH that may not necessarily fall into the classic, you know, the diagnosis, uh, including IH and just headaches. So that's kind of what I've seen. And so I have seen in, you know, in a couple of years here that the far majority of the patients have the focal stenosis. So, um, you know, initially we were doing a handful of these patients and we were mainly treating the classic 
um, you know, papilledema patient. And as we kind of grew the practice, the, the, the um, referring physicians in our neuroscience group, we kind of had a discussion that we really saw benefit to the patient that um, maybe was something that was underutilized. And so, you know, it was kind of brought to me like, hey, I think we're not treating enough patients. I think we can do better. And, you know, and that's where um, we as a group, you know, who are kind of um, offering a treatment, um, you know, we that's a, it's a great space to be in because we want to be careful, right? So as it's been well described and documented, this treatment of IH compared to the other surgical managements uh, does carry a... Um, you know, a procedural risk that is is definitely more grave than, for example, some of the other you know, with shunting or uh, optic nerve fenestration. And so that's where we have an obligation as a community to really, you know, protect and kind of offer this treatment in the safest way possible, because these are our youngest patients who are generally, you know, quite healthy and, and, and very um, functional and have a significant, um, you know, life ahead of them. Can I, can I jump in and ask a quick question? Can you just explain a little bit more about the group you're currently in? Because that sounds like a, maybe a, a unique scenario compared to some more, you know, settings where you may join a practice or, you know, as a neurointerventionalist, and it's a little bit, the community is a little bit more disparate in terms of like where you're getting your referrals and whatnot. It sounds like you have a very collegial like atmosphere that's beneficial. Yeah. So, you know, um, are all the neuroscience physicians um, all work on the same floor. And so, um, yeah, maybe some, maybe our, our ophthalmologist is not in our building, but um, we all kind of work together. And so um, we are in the same medical group. So being under the same umbrella has been significantly helpful because um, we have the ability kind of just to relate and we kind of, um, you know, we're under the same umbrella to really you know, offer kind of our services. So within within our neuroscience uh, group, we've seen that people tend to naturally create a niche or have a niche. And so, you know, part of the leadership process has been, okay, we maybe we need a few pieces to fill this disease treatment versus a few pieces. And so I think there's less overlap, for example, than maybe in the classic private world or maybe um, in a similar to the academic world where there's just kind of a, a more of a balance, I would say. And so uh, it just, you know, just part of this big multi-specialty group that, um, you know, it just has uh, developed and it's really worked through the kind of um, service line model. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, that and then so that's kind of also been helpful the rest of our um, treatment options that we offer for other conditions. But um, <clears throat> so venous manometry, I think, is uh, a very important type of data point that we can use to really allow understanding of severity and, you know, the degree of, of the stenosis and where we are in this kind of in the process. And so um, there's data that shows that you can tip it, you can do this now under general anesthesia or MAC. And, but historically, you know, the, the less we kind of um, change any sort of um, parameter for the patient, the more likely we can get a true gradient. And so, you know, we have been doing these under local anesthesia, um, the patients, it's always a little bit, uh, you know, it's a little bit of nervous time for them, but, you know, it's really, uh, once we, um, you know, get them comfortable um, beyond, you know, the access, it's a pretty well tolerated um, procedure. And I'll, I'll show a couple of videos and, and um, studies that I've showed to kind of show up quickly and how safely we can do this. And I, and this is pretty standard, I would say, with most folks doing venous and ascenting. We have just kind of had a more of a streamlined process where, okay, everybody's going to get a venous manometry. We're going to kind of do the same way. And, um, you know, it really has been helpful to kind of keep it at the, you know, few, few uh, rooms that we want to use with the same kind of team to keep it consistent to make sure that we have kind of internal control of the um the pressure monitoring. And so um, after that, then we'll kind of consider, okay, then we'll have a discussion with the patient. Okay, so we kind of now have your diagnosis and now we have a venous manometry. Where, where do we think we, you know, how are we feeling about, you know, your ability to kind of see if we can modify the disease with diet and exercise and medical treatment with the, with the diuretic, Diamox or, or Topamax. 
And this will be a nice, healthy discussion. And so, you know, we often see patients that are very excited about stenting. We'll see some patients who are not so excited about stenting. And so this is where we kind of want to, where I want to sit with them and, and help them make a decision that they are most happy and comfortable with. And so, you know, I have patients that I still see that we've never treated uh, surgically, right, or interventionally, but um, they're doing quite well medically. And so, um you know, this is where we have to kind of help the patient make a decision because they're, you know, the in any any procedure, despite all of our best efforts, to carry some some risks. Right. So uh, let me jump into just a couple, an example that I think is useful, and I'll I want to point out some things that I think that um, you know, we should all as um, IH practitioners be thinking about. So this is a um, coronal time of flight MRV, and let me just pause it. And so in clinical practice, we will see that oftentimes um, neuroradiologists, when they interpret venography studies, they're mainly looking for sinus thrombosis. And so, you know, they're, they're looking to see if the, the Titanic sinking, they're not looking to see if, you know, you know, there's a stenosis, but you can clearly see, for example, in this right transverse sinus dominant system that we lose the flow related enhancement in the right transverse sinus and the classic triangular uh, vein is now flattened due to kind of this extrinsic compression and so that kind of clues me in right away and so this is something that we deal with as a community of, of ih practitioners is that the information that we get is not really oftentimes accurate. So you will get reports of patients who have negative imaging. Well, we know it's not negative, right? Because we treat. And so this is where um, the, what I've done as kind of a way to kind of improve the practices. Okay. I take these cases and I go back and I share them with our um, neuroradiology group at our section meeting and say, look, I know this looks like um, it's negative for sinus thrombosis, but really the patient's getting this workup because they have, they're concerned about venous stenosis or they have pulsal tinnitus. Brian, can I, ask you, can I ask you a question? You're obviously an uh, expert in uh, neuroradiology. It's a simple, simple brain surgeon question here. I get a lot of referrals for patients with a, I mean, maybe this is just community neuroradiology where I practice, but I get a lot of referrals for, for venous sinus thrombosis and what it turns out to be is venous sinus stenosis in patient by age. Have you, have you seen that? Or is that something that you're like, oh, actually, no, that's pretty simple to like, to look at the to look at the MRV and be able to discern between the two. No, I I think um because you know there's some clinical overlap right with symptoms with headache and so there's often a um I would say there's le there's less comfort in interpreting venous studies in terms of um you know a radiologist in terms of training and there's often times where hypoplastic sinuses are often uh, hedged as occluded or uh, thrombosed versus, you know, unclear if this is a variant. But we, you know, once you kind of develop a good cadence, so I wanted to share some pointers, you know, with our with our with our team. So, you know, the the dominant sinus usually has kind of like a, a leaning of uh, the, the superior sagittal sinus kind of will drain naturally into the dominant sinus. So we can see that clearly the right side is the dominant. This is the coronal image. And then we see the usually the uh, the deep system will be drained by the non-dominant sinus. And so once I've determined the dominance, you know, I have a fairly strong sense that we're not going to send the non-dominant side because that's really where not the benefit. That's not where much of the flow is, and that's not where the benefit's going to be. And so when we're doing our venous manometry, we were thinking about that ahead of time. So the patient's awake. We don't need to look at all of the veins. Um, I, we usually try to get have a um, time of flight MRA available too to make sure there's no dural fistula or some other cause of pulsal tinnitus or other ideology of venous hypertension. And so um, we don't get arterial access. So we'll just do a, a venous uh, manometry. It takes 10, 10, 15 minutes, and the patients are in and out very quickly. Um, so it's right here, clearly the right transverse sinus in this image is is – non-visualized so you know it's occluded it's or it's a stenosis but you're right if somebody's reading this it's it could easily be interpreted oh is it's occluded but you know you know clinically the patient's not in the hospital with a sinus thrombosis so that's why you know i can more confidently say that um you know that it, this is a stenosis 
So similarly, I think one of the, the better sequences to kind of um, understand your the veins is the post contrast T one imaging, where the with the three D um, uh, thick you know thick uh, sorry thin sections. And so this is a um, same patient the T one post contrast. You see the veins quite well. Dominant right transverse sinus. And classically on this image, this is where I see my, you know, I would say the extrinsic compression. So usually within um, the, the mid to lateral uh, junction of the transverse sinus. And this is where I've classically seen this short segment stenosis. And so I try to pay attention to the rest of the vein because uh, unlike the MRV, the post contrast, the entire vein should have contrast within it. So you should you will see it pretty well. The time of flight one has some artifact. And so one kind of take home point is that if your patients are getting a workup, it's useful to work with the radiology group or the imaging center to say, look, can we have a IAH or pulse cell tennis workup, you know, kind of protocol. So in that way, these kind of studies are done before you see the patient. All right, let me go to the next slide. So this is our venous manometry. You can see the patient's awake, they're blinking. And so then I, you know, I learned this from, you know, I think Dr. Comfy describes this, you know, early in the venous sinus stenting practice. You know, it's useful to get your microcatheter up to the superior side of sinus. And again, I'm not, we're not doing this for luminography to see, you know, how big the sinus is or where the, uh, we want to see where the dominant flow is. And so that's what I convinced myself, okay, most of the venous flow is to the right. And so this is a lateral projection showing the same thing. So this is a 21 microcatheter. So there's a nice study that shows that you can get good venous manometry through a 21 microcatheter. So it's a six French envoy catheter, the jugular bulb, and then a, a, a Prowler 21 select plus um, at the kind of posterior superstratus signs. Slime. So I think it's also important to accurately document where you're seeing your stenosis and what your pressure monitoring is. And so it's, it's useful to go back and reference too, because you can actually see, okay, the real gradient is between, for example, in our chart, um, position eight and position 10. And so the other benefit of this type of setup is it gives cadence for like the team to really know, okay, this is how we're going to record this. We're going to record it the same way. And so you really have internal control rather than necessarily um, kind of a, you know, arbitrary way of doing it every, um, every time. This is a systemic, uh, systematic way where we can document the pressures. And uh, we have this chart. We always put it right next to the, um, the monitor and the biplane room. And so the team is, everybody's looking at this and they hear, okay, position four, what's our, what's our um, pressure? And so we we can you know be very consistent with that. So we can see it that for example in this patient that we just uh, did there's a big pressure difference between the right lateral transverse and the sigmoid junction. So um, so so at this point you know we have the discussion with the patient and uh, you know we, we we trial medical therapy and in this patient um, there is intolerance to diamox and there is persistence of papilledema and so we we then said okay we're going to do venous sinus stenting and so we try to um, try to use some of the safest you know approaches to mitigate risk right so the biggest risk is um, you know intracranial hemorrhage related to either wire or balloon or catheter manipulation. And so um, there's there's ways to kind of, I would say, uh, assess for that. There's no ways to, you know, essentially, um, you know, control for it, but there's ways to assess for it. So a lot of folks will do arterial access and, um, you know, do control runs. And so uh, that was initially our practice very early on that we would get uh, bilateral access and do control runs to look for any sort of issue. We found that in our practice uh, over the last couple of years, the only complication that we really had was a retroperitoneal hemorrhage in an obese patient where we kind of had a borderline access to the four French catheter uh, system. And, and so even to mitigate that, you know, one complication, we stopped getting venous access because there's, there's a sense in the community that um, 
certain approaches could be used, for example, and if you could uh, optimize how you're getting your uh, microcatheter and your guide catheter in place, you can you can really do it safely without arterial access. So I'll show some of some of the strategies that I think are helpful. So this is that same Prowler 21 microcatheter. This is a Transcend EX Platinum wire. And so what I want to show is that um, that despite you know the urge to maybe cross a stenosis or cross uh, a lesion with the with the wire just in its kind of a, you know kind of an angled position or you know shape we really want to cross with the J because it really shows that you're beyond any sort of septation. And, and oftentimes there may be parallel channels that are on top of each other and you're not really sure which sinus you're going to stent. So you want to stay, stay in the largest lumen, which the, the jade wire will. And so we kind of um, make it a habit. Okay. We're going to show us crossing in this fashion every time. And so that kind of makes us happy that we're not, um, you know, in something small or um, something that could be challenging to send. So then um, by advancing the uh, uh, seven, a six French catheter to the torcular region, you can do a run and you can kind of really see a lot more anatomy through a venogram than maybe through your arterial angiogram because, you know, with your arterial angiogram, you're going to get a lot of unopacified blood. And what six French catheter is that? This is a benchmark. So we have been um, historically using a uh, a neuron max from the groin with a uh, 105 centimeter benchmark, and then uh, through the benchmark, we'll use like a uh, even a four French catheter, like a Prowler Plus, or the, sorry, Phenom Plus, and then a Prowler microcatheter and a 14 wire to kind of to bring that system up slowly in a tapered fashion. Uh -huh. So I'll show on the lateral. I think you can kind of appreciate the, the focal. Let me see if I can get that exact image. So you can really see that, you know, where the focal stenosis from the lateral. The, the unfortunate issue of the lateral is you can't really um, measure the length as well. But, you know, you kind of get a better sense of the focality of the, of the stenosis with the, the nice venogram. So, okay, so in my mind, okay, I look at this and I say, okay, this is a focal. And let me see if I can show my A plane well. So right there, I see, okay, this is a short segment focal stenosis and using, you know, what has been described, the vein being more of a triangular structure than like an oval structure, let's try to undersize the stent. So we're using a lot of sevens and maybe sometimes an eight. But so I think this was a um, 830 stent or 740, I'm not sure, but let's just see on the next picture. Yeah, so this is um, should have been before, but this is essentially showing that by advancing the six French catheter to the the torcular region, it's much easier to then deliver. So at this point, I will pull the intermediate system, and only the um, the catheter will be there, and then we will then backload the wire into the stent system with a very heavy J, and that way we know that the jade wire is so even more than the current configuration. <laughs> So this is just some measurements just to show, okay, we did measure, but you know, where the where the sinus is largest is where we don't even anticipate leaving a stent. We want to be in this, you know, X4, X3, X2 range kind of region. All right. So this is um so this is a precise stent. Um I want to say this is the 830. Which will go through this a benchmark. Yes, they'll go through a benchmark. And so then, you know, this is, and uh, it's useful to remember that it's helpful to have the longer length uh, delivery catheter, the 100, and so 105 centimeter benchmark. So same thing. So, you know, though there are some kind of practices and look, you know, where uh, we're stenting from the torcula to the, down to the sigmoid, that certainly could be done here, but then there's going to be areas of malaposition. And really what we've seen is that, that stenting this little, area with kind of a not oversized stent, you kind of get a nice result with uh, very low treatment rates. And I'll kind of show that what we've seen. All right, so there's that. Um, and then I'll over the stent delivery system, let's see, I try to get the catheter to kind of track back and I'll do a um, another run just to see what it looks like. And you kind of see, okay, yeah, there's much better kind of flow through the, um, the sinus at that point. And so that's what, you know, just kind of a sub unsubtracted with our catheter in place. It's a benchmark MP catheter. 
Um, so this is what I wanted to show how we kind of take it up in a tapered fashion. So, you know, there the moment when you're crossing the stenosis, I've always noticed that there's sometimes a little bit of um kind of a um there is definitely it's less smooth. And so it's nice to take the um uh, the larger catheter over a kind of a tapered um you know slight catheter. And so I know there's lots of setups that folks use you with, with the from a track star to um you know Sophia's and so anyway regardless of the setup I think it's helpful to have a uh, kind of a tapered and kind of a um rather than than taking something with a large step off you know with a wire and a you know and I, is that kind of in your experience as well Brian yeah I mean I think that's yeah and I think like you said you know you really just have to be a lot more particular about um you know, I think all of us are a little bit more particular about venous anatomy than we are, especially arterial, but that's just kind of like a, a general practice, you know. I say, the only time I'm not that worried about step offs is usually like when you're trying to track something into the cervical carotid, but otherwise you're you're pretty careful about it. Exactly. Okay. Same page. Um So systematically, after we've um, deployed the stent, we'll pull, so with that benchmark, we'll pull it down a little bit, but we'll still keep in the sinus. We'll do an intra-procedural DynasDT. So we want to really confirm, okay, is there any hemorrhage? Is there anything we're worried about? We're here. Can we put a balloon across the stent if we need to kind of tampon out any hemorrhage? Other kind of strategies that we try to use to avoid um, any complication is angioplasty. And part of the rationale behind that is that um, the stenosis we know is is a critical or a high grade stenosis. We often have trouble crossing with the fourteen wire, right? So now with the stent, even if it doesn't look perfect or it's not perfectly well open, we still get um, a good flow improvement, you know, with Laplace's law. And so rather than you know, this is the classic, I would say, the radiologist mistake that that people try to describe is treating a picture and not the patient. Right. And so, you know, even if the stent doesn't look good. So, you know, have I left stents in it with kinks or kind of a kind of a uh, acute angle? No problem. And the patients do fine. And so it's not really necessarily making the stent look perfect because you've already really done the job by creating that scaffolding to kind of push some of that internal debris or just that extrinsic stenosis to the side. Yep. So, good. No, I was just going to say, I think that, that's a good point, bringing up Laplace's law. That's something, you know, sometimes we don't think about or you can, you know, so definitely, definitely something to keep in mind here. Perfect is the enemy of good, I think, in these situations. So um, you can get that restoration. You can eliminate the gradient without a perfect, um, without a perfect uh, reduction in angiographic stenosis. Yeah. So, you know, there's certain diseases that we treat that inherently are more risky um, and have a different natural outcome you know, then maybe our, uh, then in our usual treatment approach. So classic is like a thrombectomy. So, you know, if a patient has a tandem stenosis occlusion and they have an intracranial, you know, large vessel occlusion, then you're going to take the risk by going through the carotid, potentially, you know, creating more debris for ultimately, you know, uh, relief of the thrombat, you know, M1 occlusion. So you're going to fix both or you're going to get to the clot. Well, in this circumstance, I always try to think, okay, is there a way I can essentially have a no risk procedure? And so that's why we try to do these certain types of approaches where we basically don't accept any potential risk of a complication because how devastating it could be for the patient and essentially this this treatment option. Got it. All right, so here we go. Let's see what this next thing is. So this then what we have historically been doing is a uh, dual antiplatelet therapy treatment. Uh, we usually load them about seven days before. We have also started to check the verify now platelet aggregation um, assay, and um, we've had a few non-responders, so we will switch their P2Y12 inhibitor and um, keep them on them for six months. And in six months, we'll do a CT venogram. So whereas the MRV is a fantastic way to really, um, you know, diagnose the patient, the really the best way to follow the patient, and it's not ideal in a young patient to do a CT venogram, but 
it's just a one-time study, you really get much better luminal understanding than necessarily from MRV. So it's just going to be too much artifact with that. So you can see, all goes nice slowly, but you can see the stent very well. You can see any stent formate, you know, thrombus formation. There's like a little filling defect that we see right there that didn't bear out to be anything. But you can see very subtle changes, you know, if there's thrombosis or stent. And so at this point, if the um, stenting looks good and the patient's doing well, then we just stop the Plavix at six months and then we continue baby aspirin for another year and a half. So I know a lot of patients and in practices may commit patients to aspirin for life. These patients oftentimes go on to, um, uh, you know, having children or becoming pregnant. Um, they need uh, other procedures and uh, or maybe surgeries you know and so it's not ideal to necessarily have to keep them on even even aspirin so for we've been doing that and we've had pretty good success and so i'm willing to i'll show some of our kind of um, what we've seen but that's gonna been our usual approach so six months of dual antiplatelet therapy and then another year and a half of aspirin for a total of uh, two years of being on aspirin so over a couple of years now, um, we have about 150 patients that we treated. And so this is kind of our stent breakdown. 90% of the time we're using another seven millimeter stent. Uh, and so with the 30 millimeter stent, it takes a little bit of more uh, comfort to kind of really land it on the spot because, you know, we don't want to be in a circumstance where you miss the stenosis and have to place a second one. But this is where, you know, the experience and having kind of, you know, more, um, I would say venous heavy operators doing some of this stuff. And so we we have kind of leaned that way where we kind of have more venous heavy operators that that have more comfort with that. And I would say, you know, in our practice, we've seen a minority of the long segment fulminate, you know, patients that um you need the, the super long, you know, silver type stents, so seven by sixty or seven, you know, eight by ninety or something like that. And we, you know, a few times we had to place two stents next to each other before we had access to the long stent. But, um, and our restenosis rate is quite low. And so I think we attribute this mainly to the, you know, the smaller size stent. And so the way I try to think about it is just that similarly that we don't need to, you know, make the, the blood vessel look um, perfect. You know, the analogy that I use to the patient is that, you know, we have a five lane freeway that went to one lane because of a traffic accident. You know, we need to make it back to two to three lanes. We don't need to make it a five lane freeway anymore. Right. And so that carries more risk and carries more potential risk for, you know, um, stenosis maybe at the at the uh, adjacent to the stent. I think I've talked about this. Um, this is our typical post-procedural dual antiplatelet therapy plan and our venous follow-up. And so in the majority of the patients, we're seeing them at six months and they're doing great. We uh, say, okay, if you have recurrent symptoms, um, please you know, reach out to us. And the other thing is that all the papilledema patients have kind of lifelong um, you know, neuro-ophthalmology follow-up. <laughs> So kind of from our experience, we haven't had any intrapatheal complications in knock on wood, mainly because I think some of the, the approaches that we're using, we did have a, a patient with retroperitoneal hemorrhage that we've now mitigated by not getting arterial access. And I would say, uh, you know, we are seeing patients, even with a lower uh, diameter stent, have some headache afterwards in the first couple of days from this, you know, the dural stretch type of headache. And what we found to be very useful for that is a... Um, is rather than the classic, uh, you know, pain medication, we found that neuromodulary, neuromodulating medications such as nortriptyline or amitriptyline is actually uh, a nice uh, way to kind of mitigate some of that. And so that's a medication they take at night. Uh, for some patients, we've had them take it, you know, the first week after stenting, and it's really helped. Wow. Okay. And so yeah, that's you know, and the you know, how do we get to this point? It's you know, the classic inpatient setup where, you know, you've kind of exhausted everything, all the pain medicines up to steroids. And so, and so we, it's kind of a, um, you know, it, I don't know, how, I don't recall how I, I think I learned this in my training, but it's just has something that I carried on. And I don't know how strong the literature is for that, but we have seen it anecdotally work quite well for, our, you know, this 5%. So what, so what strategy, you know, do we use to kind of mitigate any risk, right? Because this is the procedure where we don't want to have any risk, right? So we uh, always J the wire. We like using the transcendiax platinum wire that it's a nice 
wire that kind of even if it does go into a small cortical vein and wants to just pop out and it's because it has that soft tip um and and then we like to gradually cross the stenosis there are some times where the microcatheter the microwire easily crosses stenosis but the intermediate catheter does not want to track and so okay i pull back and then we try again because maybe it's not the the right angle or maybe not the right um you know the, there's you know maybe it's a uh, fenestrated sinus at that point that, you know, that we're not really appreciating on our, on our venography, right? Cause we don't really have access for that. And so, uh, for that roadmap, um, and then we always do a systematic post-procedural CT in the room while we have the catheter in place. Uh, we do some verify now testing as we talked about just to make sure that there's no, uh, non, -res non response to the medications and we avoid angioplasty and we only have been stenting the dominant sinus. And that's to be the idea that the non-dominant sinus may have slightly slower flow, slightly higher risk of thrombosis. You know, the co-dominant sinus stenting patient um, is, is, is you know, that that is a certain percentage of the patients that have the fulminant disease that, you know, we've had to treat and like other centers. But I think that um, if you can convince yourself with the microcatheter run with your dominant sinus, I think that that's where we've found the most success. So some of our keys has been to focus really on patient selection, really making the decision with the patient and, you know, the, using the venous manometries are basically our kind of barometer. Okay. How straightforward was the access? Okay. It was quite straightforward. Um, you know, stenting should be a similar type of um, kind of uh, anatomy. And so our nice partnership with, you know, essentially centered around our ophthalmology team and our ophthalmologist to really, you know, kind of help, develop the practice and then um then sizing the stent and using the short one for i would say the the short segment disease see so yeah, i you know I, I ended a little early but i want to keep some uh time to kind of discuss some of the you know this is kind of a different talk than that we typically have for the ih hub and because i didn't share much of the you know the literature but i wanted to share just my clinical experience yeah uh awesome um awesome presentation one question i had is so it seems like that you guys are doing your venous sinus manometry pretty early in after the diagnosis. Like how, how does that, because for most of us, you know, that we're getting referred patients. And then if we're seeing, typically for me, if I'm seeing them early in the course or perhaps other people, then we say, oh, well, you know, you should go fail medical management first and then come back to me. So why, why the change in doing it early? Yeah. So, you know, um, the, the venous sinus stenosis um, as kind of, you know, in Kyle's, you know, work up has really showed, you know, that you can, you kind of have to look at, you know, the heart, you have to look at the body habitus. And there are some patients that don't really have a significant gradient in a way that other patients might have. And so by doing the venous manometry earlier, you can really set, assess the severity of the stenosis or the, the gradient. And so if we see very high pressures in the superior sagittal sinus and see a significant drop, we know that, for example, we may have room to, you know, maybe they're going to, um, there's an opportunity to kind of go up on the diamox and maybe other ways that we wouldn't, or we kind of know, okay, hey, let's, let's do medical management, or we kind of have a nice discussion with the, the neuropathologist. Okay, there's a pretty high gradient, you know, um, you know, how is the patient's papilledema doing? And so that's, we, we kind of use it as kind of a data point to really see, okay, and if there's not a significant gradient, then we know, okay, maybe we're not necessarily going to be able to help with the venous sinus stenting. And so how do we kind of look at other options? Yeah. Or conversely, you say, okay, look, there's a, there's a huge gradient. Let's not, let's not torture this patient with medical therapy if we think we have a reasonable option. option Correct. Yeah, exactly. And so the, it's kind of like a, another way to really help the patient have more information and make a decision. Got it. Um, all right. We got some questions in the chat. Let me see if I can uh, go through them. One is from Dr. Altschul. She says, can you please ask if there's any issues with pre-authorization? I'm having a lot of denials. So what is your, what is your experience with? Yeah. That? So, you know, uh, similarly, we kind of face those same challenges. And so I think this is where it's nice in your documentation and within a kind of a multi, multi-specialty group to really include, um, um, you know, all of this information in your note. So, you know, this is a, you know, Miss so-and-so is a patient with uh, presenting with headaches, papilledema, uh, 
seen by our, you know, our, our neurology team and our ophthalmologist team and uh, found out papilledema. And so yeah, I think it's helpful in your documentation to include, you know, the, the summarizing the salient points and, you know, and then the challenging part is some of the um, insurance companies policies don't really have much, um, I would say wiggle room for this, you know, novel treatment. And so, you know, that's where we kind of partner with our, you know, our societies and our, SNIS and working and trying to and change some of these um, kind of unfortunate component of of medical care. But yeah, I, I, I face similar challenges. I've noticed for the venous manometry, we've had less because it's a, an angiogram, you know, venogram, angiogram type of procedure. And for the um, the venous stenting is where we come across those issues. So I, you know, I kind of share those same kind of um, issues. And I think, you know, we've all been through the appeals process and the peer, you know, the um, the call, you know, discussions with our colleagues. And um, but, um, yeah, we you know, I, I think, you know, it's helpful in, within the documentation to really, you know, include everything. And that's where really um, if this is the only option you have for the patient, or the best option for the patient, I think you can nicely summarize that that you've exhausted the other options. Yeah, I think I've noticed the same thing. It's just a lot of times, I mean, it just really is a, it's a battle. And um, I would also say, just from seeing it from the other side of neurosurgery, is that like denials are pretty common with the majority of other like neurosurgical, like uh, with a lot of other surgeries that are done, maybe not for things that are extremely urgent, but um, perhaps also, I think just as a specialty, we just, have not seen the number of denials as other medical specialists have is maybe that if that makes sense so like yeah. maybe you know, the denials are starting to starting to to come our, our way a little bit more but i think getting denials or, or not getting an authorization is is certainly um standard for a lot of um a lot of other surgeons so maybe it's something that we have to address as a society all right, next question um, comes from a patient. It seems it says, I have IIH. I've noticed that in the colder months, I have more headaches as well as more frequent other issues. I can go from one minute being able to do complex math equations to uh, forgetting the word fork, even after having a shunt. Would stenting be better? Yeah, so, the, you know, this is where kind of the, the, the challenge comes in. Um, and, uh, you know, there's so much about this disease that we totally we don't understand because we hear patients have varying symptoms based upon elevation, based upon weather, um, you know, and Dr. Link's work. You know, I think there's, you know, the, clearly there's a sense that there's a glio-lymphatic component to this as well. And so I think there's a lot about the disease we don't totally understand. And, and oftentimes that's what I try to be uh, clear about in the beginning, you know, we don't know. And so it's easy, you know, I just have to be honest, you know, I don't know, um, you know, along that kind of not, you know, not answering the question directly, but, you know, I think there's a component of chronic venous hypertension that is a little under recognized in the literature. And we're hopefully trying to do a little bit of research in our practice with like a pre and post cognitive scoring. But, you know, you hear patients, you know, mention how much crisper their thinking is and how much better they're thinking. And, you know, it, it's, um, you know, it, again, this is subjected to the patient, but the patient is experiencing that. And so um, I think that the, the component of, you know, like low grade chronic venous hypertension, we don't totally understand how it works. And, and every patient is different because everybody's venous drainage is different. And so that's, what's inherently very challenging about this disease. I think that unlike arterial disease where um, a large vessel occlusion in the MCA has a very consistent M1, you know, syndrome, right? right. Uh, a classic transverse sinus stenosis based upon your venous anatomy is different for every patient. So some patients have dizziness, some people, some patients have brain fog, some patients have classic papilledema, some patients only have a tinnitus only presentation. So I really think that having variant venous anatomy has made it challenging. And so the IH understanding of, uh, the understanding of IH has really been related to the fulminant presentation of papilledema, right, in the literature. And so the non, um, you know, papilledema symptoms, 
hasn't necessarily gained, gained as much traction in terms of kind of evaluating and really understanding how um, treatment or the disease, you know, results in these kind of conditions. So, you know, I'm not saying I understand that or we, you know, the society understand that, but I think it's important to consider that those kind of myriad of symptoms could potentially be explained by, you know, this condition. And just as a, just a segue to that, and this is something I've, I've seen not infrequently in clinic is patients, patients come to see me who've already had a shunt and they're still having those, those non-fulminant symptoms. You know, maybe they've seen a neuro-ophthalmologist and they don't have papilledema anymore since being shunted, but their myriad of symptoms aren't gone. So how, how do you, like, what's your experience in like dealing with patients who've already had a shunt or is that something where you're like, no, no, we, we're, we're happy to evaluate them or, or do you say, oh no, actually, if, you know, if they've had the shunt like that, that's another treatment option. And we, we don't really consider stenting them. Yeah, no, at, at that point we'd kind of, you know, work the patient up de novo again. Right. And so we, as long as they have no, uh, preclusion, you know, for, from getting a venous manometry or eventually having to get, uh, be on dual antiplatelet therapy. I think there's some inherent challenges there. And so that's where kind of like my, my mind goes to, okay, you, you know, uh, my partner always makes a great state statement and whatever decision you make, think four steps down the line of the consequences. And so, you know, just, this is where, um, certain, certain presentations of this or certain, um, treatments that patients may already have, it's just important to be mindful. Okay. How, what are we going to be, you know, how's it going to look if we're on dual antiplatelet therapy and we need to do a, you know, they need to shunt revision or they might need uh you know uh, they may have a infection and so and so that's the that's always the challenging part to really you know how do you how do you go forward and so that's also true with patients with certain underlying medical conditions right to make it makes it and so that i think that's where you know you kind of make the decision around the patient because uh you know, if you know that somebody's going to be needing major surgery, for example, or bariatric surgery or something like that, that's coming up. Those are important kind of things to kind of really uh, line up before you you do this procedure, because that's where the patient's going to be unhappy. And that's where kind of like uh, you run into challenges. And so we try to always, you know, clear the runway before we're going to do any like anything like this. At least that's kind of what I found to be the most, um, I would say, uh, you know, streamlined, simplest way to get, you know, less issues got it uh another one you know another patient um question i think we've kind of addressed this but i'll just have it i'll just bring it up my biggest concern is the dizziness that i have usually followed by pt i'm getting my stent on january 30th the doctor said the stent won't help the dizziness but i've seen some webinars here that speak to the resolution of that symptom um can you speak to what you've seen in your practice with regards to patients' symptoms of dizziness after stenting? Yeah, so um, what? Yeah, exactly. So one of the one of the biggest challenges is prognosticating, you know, treatment response, right? So we know prognostic treatment response is great with papilledema, pulsatile tinnitus, but headache and the other myriad of symptoms. It's very difficult to prognosticate. Um, I would say the headache that is the 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 classic bending over, tying your shoelace headache the, that I've seen also, you know, have a, a being that specific. Okay, yes, that has had some better response, but you know, some of the other headaches or other descriptions of headaches, you know, not sure. And I think the literature also says that as well. But um, you know, dizziness I think is one of the more under recognized kind of. Um, uh, symptoms of IH and, you know, again, is it related to some of those, you know, the, the vein, the posterior circulation veins that drain into the, you know, that region where there's a stenosis, not clear. Um, but we have seen patients describe, um, you know, surprisingly that they, they don't have dizziness, but again, we don't have the perspective or any, any evidence to say that it's just been anecdotal. So I wouldn't, um, you know, it, we don't typically advise patients or mention that, okay, yes, this is going to resolve. We can't, we just don't know. The right. the one, the, the only areas that I think we can confidently say that there's going to be good response is, is papilledema and pulse, ipsilateral pulse synchronous pulsal tinnitus. Got it. Um, let's see another question. What do you do with patients with stable grade one papilledema and stable vision? Yeah. So, you know, 
this is where we really have a discussion with a patient, you know, you know, so if there's the typical classic, uh, the, the body habitus that would respond, for example, to uh, maybe diet or exercise, uh, you know, weight loss, then we try to see, okay, are there strategies that we can really use to, um, to, you know, for example, to um, lose weight, which we know is quite helpful in IIH. Um, but that's where, you know, I think it helps to have a team discussion because, you know, uh, this is where we have to rely on the neuro-ophthalmologist. Okay, what what do we think is the natural history? How is this patient going to do with grade one papilledema who's 25, right? So it's, I think that's where, uh, you know, you have to kind of work together as a team and really have a discussion with the patient. And uh, there's definitely some uncertainty, right, about some of these, uh, the natural history of that type of component of the disease versus the treated history. Yeah. Um, I think that wraps it up for questions from the chat. Um, and I we want to be respectful of your time. So, you know, Dr. Kangor, thank you so much for, for your talk. I learned a lot as I always do on these things. I feel like uh, it's a great, great way for me to learn more about stenting. So um, we really appreciate it. And, um, you know, we're going to put some links in the chat so you can learn about more about Dr. Kangura and his practice or how to follow him on Twitter. Um, so, uh, thanks everybody for attending and, uh, we'll see you at the next, uh, we'll see you at the next, um, webinar.